Susan got scared. She thought she was late when she walked in. Her car. Oh my God! Something that kid is like something that the rest of his life would be replaying at the Well, and and the too, because he said we were six inches away from me guaranteeing keeping my job. He's texting. He's like, he's like, it's one thing. He's a great guy. He's got a great, good run. Oh, he's gonna go. He'll get picked up. He'll get picked up too. I don't know what. All right, folks, All right. thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to call together to call to order the December 13th transportation work session. Um, thanks again. Thank you, staff, for getting us together. I know last time we had this conversation was a very robust uh, conversation and a lot of sharing. So hopefully it will be the same. We'll run this like a work session, so no need to uh, request uh, permission to speak to the chair. Uh, just, just be nice. It's Christmas. Be nice. <laughs> and at that, I will turn it over to Mr. Warren. All right. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, members of the board. Uh, we are originally when I had talked about doing a workshop with the board today. This one and one in March was kind of a two-part series about funding and then how do we take that funding and apply it to the CIP. I would even say this is really a three-parter when we go back to our workshop we had in June when we talked about projects that we currently have going on and ones that are kind of on tap. Part of the March one would be taking those projects and seeing how these funding sources will be applied to those and then as well as the future so we can really plan this out. The goal here for the county is to come up with a six-year plan. Everything kind of works in six years in the transportation world. So it's a six-year plan on prioritization and funding application cycles. So today's goal is to talk through pretty much all the funding applications that we we have eligible to us, that we may be eligible for, but it's certainly not all-encompassing. Things are popping out pretty much weekly out of the uh, federal infrastructure bill. EDOT finds out about a new grant opportunity and lets us know. So this is kind of where it stands currently. Uh, and look forward to getting into some of this. Um, okay, so we're going to run through current project updates on a couple of things that are currently underway in the county. Uh, collaboration of partners, how we can use our regional partners to our uh, advantage. The funding sources, we're going to run through four different pots of money, essentially, federal, state, regional, and then local, and then we'll, we'll talk about some future topics at the very end. So a couple of current projects we have going on are related to Fairgrounds Road. Uh, the Fairgrounds Road roundabout is currently on schedule. Uh, the contractor and VDOT are working on firming up really some of the detour dates. That's really going to be a big impact to the community, especially really localized around the intersection. So we're slated for that right now to be kind of late winter, early spring. The firm dates of that are going to be worked out and hopefully by the end of the year, if not by the end of January, for us to be able to get that out to the community so we can be best prepared for that. Sure, can I get a quick question for a second? Yes. So I know there's not a formal agenda board, but if there's anything that's not on here that you want to just tee up so that you can either add it or as the mm -hmm. process is going through, so we can talk about it. I just wanted to kind of pause you for that. Yeah. Yeah, and appreciate it. If there's any questions during this week, there's a question slide at the end, but don't hold anything till the end. <laughs> um, anything right now? Okay. Um, yeah, and completion of the roundabout is currently slated for October of 2023, so that is right on schedule with, with where the original proposal was. So we're looking forward to getting that, uh, just keeping that moving on. Uh, and then the secondary project on Fairground Road is the corridor study. We are expecting final deliverables in the next four to six weeks or so. We're really excited about that. I think um, the interim kind of midway meeting we had on some of the initial deliverables and the proposals is really, I think, heading in the right direction as far as some safety improvements along the corridor as well as some capacity improvements. 
Uh, we'll touch on some of that uh, later on when we get into some into some of the funding, and I know VDOT's going to speak to, to one of the possible avenues we could take some of those projects and potentially get them funded. Um, the study is really safety focused, but also reviewing a few key intersections. Uh, so we're looking forward to getting those final deliverables and seeing what improvements, if any, are made along that corridor. Um, Mr. Scott? Yes. Um, sorry to keep making you pause. Go ahead. Because uh, I appreciate when we put what we have to do. Um, with the Fairgrounds Road, obviously people see construction there. Yes. They see the road kind of go up to the laydown mm -hmm. yard. And there are you know, so I've gotten a lot of comments, uh, both positive and negative, okay. about the, uh, the fairgrounds around extension. Okay. We've always talked. Well, we always. We've talked about them a lot in con connection with each other. Correct. Um, are we going to discuss? Will that be a part of our discussion today? Because we've done a lot of work. We've spent a lot of right. time. We've probably spent a lot of money. So we'll touch on the fairgrounds extension when we talk about the funding source we did use for that, which is revenue sharing. Um, we was not going to touch on that as far as getting to real details, uh, the timing of that project. That was, those real details would be kind of worked out as far as getting the extra money we need for that project kind of in the March workshop. But I'm also happy to answer any questions you may have now. And if there's anything I need to address when we get to that slide. Okay, okay. great. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to have an update on that. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I get a lot of comments. Yeah, and, and we can provide any kind of specifics as a sidebar to this project or anything, you know, I know another uh, high priority issue is the Hockett Road realignment. And I, I will, let me preface that before I jumped in that I apologize not physically being in the room there with you all. I've been running a fever for the last few days. So I was carrying on the abundance of caution or whatever mystery thing this is that is giving me a fever. That those are much more uh, easy to spread than gifts they give during the holiday season. Um, but Austin, you know, is really trying to work on focusing on the high level things for us of um, projects that are in funding queues and what sort of lots of money we should be educating ourselves on as we look to identify things and things that may apply in your district or other high level transportation needs. And we kind of go from there with kind of strategizing as we move forward and try to grow what it is that is going to start to become Lucian's transportation program within the county and um, its reputation and place within the region. Let me tell you why I'd like to have that conversation here as opposed to a side art is because the- Oh, no, that, that's you know, today's purpose. No, I'm talking about the Fairgrounds Road specifically, the extension, oh. um, which is just, just to understand, get the update, like mm -hmm. Ms. Last Blood said, because citizens are saying we ran out of money. They're saying you try to build a school, but you're already running out of money products and I don't think that's the actual story so I just want to understand okay. be able and, to, and, for us to be able to and I do touch on that as, as far as talk when I get to the revenue sharing uh, portion of it, I do touch on the fairgrounds extension so we can have that then if you want I mean I'm also happy to answer any questions right now uh, if you want to get into it now or do you yes. want to okay okay yeah, um, but also like are you going to be talking about the Ashland Road Diamond and Oracle? oh we're going to touch on the, some of the funding uh, opportunities for that yes <clears throat> So one thing we need to really look at moving forward with getting the county's transportation goals executed is collaboration of what regional partners do we have. We have Plan RVA, Richmond Regional Transportation Planning Organization, as well as uh, the Central Virginia Transportation Authority. The goal of those organizations and how it benefits Goochland is getting our projects that we view as current priorities into their long-range transportation plan, into the transportation improvement program, and really making them priorities in the region. Which will, bet, which will better, um, it, it'll help us get better grant applications. It will help us move forward in the region if it's seen as a regional priority. And we just continue that dialogue with the region to see that Goochland does have some projects we think are very important and they ought to be considered as a high level project in the area. Um, utilizing consultants uh, is really important, I think, to get the best applications no matter what the funding source is. If we need studies, if we need some level of preliminary engineering or design or traffic counts or, or any information, it's being able to utilize those consultants with a pot of money that we'll, we can certainly talk about later, but utilizing CBTA local funds to you know, make, maybe knock out some of that preliminary stuff to really better any application. Because the more information we submit, the better the score. Just last it looks like you have a thought or a question. Well, I mean, you're talking about us hiring consultants so for example, the Hockett Road realignment, we did have to 
we had money in the budget from previous cycles, but to get a study for a smart scale application, we do have to outsource that to third parties because we don't have the staff or the capability in house to do that kind of a deep, detailed analysis. So if we were to have submitted that project specifically for smart scale without a study, it most likely would have been screened out. So in order to be able to put our best foot forward, we, we may have to pay the bill on getting some real detailed information down first. Um, that prompts yes. Okay, yes. So at the, at the TPO, uh, this came up. This has come up recently. Came up last week. The rural jurisdictions, I mean, you know, some of the jurisdictions when we talk about things in the context of who's doing what, oftentimes some of the smaller jurisdictions will say, "We don't even have a transportation department." So I've heard that repeatedly. So I talked to the director of transportation after the meeting, and he reminded me that the TPO. Through Plan RBA, Plan RBA handles the hiring and all that, but through the TPO has a position for a traffic engineer slash somebody to help with what I think you're saying that consultants would help with. And I've been sort of supportive of that or trying to find mm -hmm. out more and have this as a TPO based resource for the rural counties that, quote, don't have a transportation department. One thing with that, so, too, is. So I just wonder does the. Is the I'm just kind of trying to get a reading from my colleagues. Is there an interest in us pursuing and maybe contributing to that and talking to the other rural, rural jurisdictions? They, they've got the job advertised. They're, okay. they're not getting, it's, it's like a lot of other things that are hard to fill. So I, I think my next step was to talk to folks at Plan RBA about what, what are the, what's the room. If we've had this job uh, posted for a long time and not getting anything, let's kick it along. Mm -hmm. So talk to Plan RBA while at the same time I'm talking to Charles City, the new Kent's for uh, Powhatan's okay. um, as, as to whether we want to really make a joint what do you mean effort. By hmm? What do you mean by well, just look, see, see how it's, again, I don't know what, what Plan RBA's budget is, I don't even know what position, but I mean, is there, it would be something that everybody would say, let's, if we're having a hard time getting a person to can, can, can the localities at the benefit that can we put a small amount towards a, towards a salary to sweeten it? And then, I mean, I don't even know that there's any discussion. I think they just are planning to hire it. This person's going to help a lot with some of the things that are happening in the TPO. Right. But he said this is... This well, is, the, the only thing I would say about that is, is knowing very well the, <coughs> the funding strategy for, for uh, Plan RBA, most of their projects <coughs> cost come back to localities. So they're just a more local consultant in a lot of cases. So we can, it, their, their, their revenues come from what we provide them. They also come from each of these grants and then acting as a funding source. So if we were to do that, we want to ensure that we're not paying on both ends of the spectrum. We already pay dues. I, I don't I don't know Where's what their plans money? are. I mean, I guess Plan, Plan RBA must have in the budget. They've got a number and they're paying with these funds. And I wasn't, that was not, I really shouldn't have brought that up because that was not my lead point. And my lead thing was, do we want, <laughs> my lead was, do we want to even push for the idea of collaborating, participating, and engaging? Because then we get into a lot of details. Well, how are we going to allocate the work? Right. Is, well, is one group going to say, well, here, I've got 10 projects I want this person to work on? Right. And, and, right. I, I think it's definitely worth exploring. Mm -hmm. A lot of conversations that are going on around, um, Austin and I were talking about this before the meeting, which is, and sh those with better estimates should do better because there's meaning if if you if we feel that you're asking for this amount of money we're certain that that's the amount of money that should do better than somebody that yeah I don't know we'll throw a number at it and back and happen. What, so, what do you mean by do better? Score, score better. Score, score better. better. Understand the, the reputation. So my so but my point is if all the other localities have that and we don't we're at a disadvantage. So we need to sort of. Because it's a, while it's it, it's we are partners and it's collaboration, it's also still competition, right? I, I said this. I, there's some there's some small jurisdictions that are pushing for fairness in, in this whole scoring process. Yeah. I I my, I chimed in and said at the, at the last last week or two's meeting is let's be realistically about what can get done politically. Yeah. So uh, I was gonna say if Boston can kind of keep on his. Right. Thing and then, well, you know, well it was just consultants. We got stuff from the consultants, but but if that's out there, I'd love to 
Do we lose connection? I think we lost internet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it looks like the internet's down there. Oh. Yeah, there is no internet. Yeah. Oh, the there. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, lost internet. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. we'll continue to move on. I guess we'll find out what happens. We're going to talk about smoke heavy issues. One thing to think Just about, too, that. is if there's one position that there's 10 or so counties and the TPO and the CBT, I think it's nine. Right, right. There's four big ones if you include yeah, Hanover, right. so five counties are fighting for one person's time. So that's a challenge as well to consider, which is why third parties I think are also very important. If all of a sudden there's a backlog there, you know, we I think we may still be at a point where we have to go to a Kimley Horn or to a Tim oh, to, to any of those. Yeah, but I, I think from a staff standpoint, I think it makes all the sense in the world to okay. explore that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I need to ask for county attorney, since we advertised that this was going to be during Zoom, do we need to pause <clears throat> because we don't have the Zoom option available now? Was it advertised public? as a Zoom meeting? I don't No. Oh, okay. No, that's just, 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 just a Zoom just component. Okay. So they no, could we just did it for me. Though. So they could still oh, one. So they can still do it live. We're back. It seems that we sent it for beat up so they can see it in crystal. This wasn't a beat up stream done. Thank you for asking, Chairman. This isn't an advertising meeting. It is an advertising meeting. And it's an advertising meeting, but not a We're going to get this back. It also says it's live on Civic Plus. It says that's the meeting at this. Okay. I understand this is good. But are we, I know we're back now, but if that happens, Warren, are we still streaming on Civic Well, it, it, it interrupted it, but it's back now. So based on interruption, do we need to pause, or are we okay to go forward? No, you're okay to go forward. Okay, good. Okay, sorry about that. Just want to keep us legal. Uh, I apologize for that. And then Austin could get back on schedule there. There we go. Okay, um, I think we're set up straight. Um, party consultants. Yeah. Um, and then one other avenue we do have, especially with the state funding sources, is, is, is VDOT, where they do offer what's called pre-scoping, where any application cycle that they have, you can essentially go through a pre-application cycle, much like we do for a rezoning application here, where you really refine your scope. You can potentially refine the cost as the scope changes, because that's one thing that happens during a lot during smart scale, is you look at your scope, and the cost is obviously greatly impacted by what the project entails and the and length and and, and, and so on. Um, have we had an opportunity to take them up on that yet? We have not, no. So I think that's something that's very important where smart smart scale applications can go through what's called the pre-scoping. It, it's its own individual portal on VDOT's website that we can use for any and everything. So I think that's something that we certainly need to look at utilizing. It's, smart scale, right? it's for smart scale, it's for uh, the TAP, which we had funding for the Eastern Trail. Um, I believe it's also good for revenue sharing. So it's any application that you can use through VDOT, Still you can go through the, the pre scope and to really refine it. That's good to know. All right. So one thing, right. I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll yeah. throw in there. And this is um, filling with VDOT, by the way. Pocket Road is a perfect example of something that there was an operational analysis that was required as part of the smart scale application. Um, we got to a point where that hadn't been done yet, but the smart scale application was due. Uh, just you know, keep in mind that our district is supporting 14 different counties throughout the Richmond area, um, which is where it, it can be beneficial if the county or if you use the TPO to help supplement to to accomplish some of those studies. Now we we can, as as Austin alluded to. Um, but it just comes down to a workload and, um, you know, fitting that into what we already have going on. So uh, the earlier the better. Um, and for Hockett Road, it, it was really helpful for the county to kind of take the lead on getting that operational analysis. So we thank you guys. But thank, Thanks, Philip. Um, so yeah, I think that's something that we certainly need to look at utilizing for, for especially the state sources. There we go. All right, so we're going to touch on uh, some funding sources. Specifically, it's kind of the most broad category. Um, Austin, can yes. I interject just for a second? I yeah, yeah, go ahead. My hand up, so I'm not interrupting, so just oh, I see that. try to look and see if you see my little yellow hand yep. up there. Yeah, I see it. Um, so one thing I want to emphasize for you all, and I, I know Austin and Philip know this, is sort of the process of why we're kind of starting down this effort with the uh, informational and discussion on the funding piece. 
is the prioritization of projects is going to start to become key because of how the VDOT funding cycle works. And as Philip mentioned, the workload. But as we identify and prioritize the many projects or the needs that there are, um, working to uh, one, align this to the best programs, but also identifying and having that discussion early and often with our VDOT uh, local office on making them aware of what the project need is, helping to best identify the program, figuring out can they do a um, local resource or what's going to be the best fit for that and timing everything right. Because a lot of those programs and also go into that, you know, some of them are every other year, some of them are annual, and there's different timelines and requirements that are needed even, um, you know, from a legislative side, you know, resolutions of support, those kinds of things outside of just um, matching funds. So I did want to mention that, and a lot of those are similar for some of the federal programs outside of um, U.S. Congress, which I know you guys are familiar with. Right. Um, so with that, so I just kind of went out on a limb and went on grants.gov, which is the home for any and all transportation funded grants. And if you search the keyword transportation, there are possible 356 applications that we could in theory apply for. We were probably eligible for less than 5% of those because we, while we can apply for everything, a lot of them are geared towards we have no travel lanes, we have no chemical plants, we have no railroad spurs we're trying to build. So really honing down what grants that we truly are eligible for and what we think will be competitive for and then also look at prioritizing grants based on county commitment required. Is there a full match? Is it a 20% match, 50-50, much like revenue sharing? So that's something that as we look at not only what projects we have that might be grant-centered or, or, or really fit well in some of these grant opportunities, it, we also have to weigh the pros and cons of each grant as far as matches and, 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 and the requirements. Uh, most of the common grants we see in the region fall under what's called complete streets, which is really geared towards bike pads, safety, some capacity improvements, uh, reconnecting some roads that have been disconnected. Uh, two of those are reconnecting communities, which we had talked about previously, but I'll, I'll touch on again very shortly. And then safe streets and roads for all. Uh, those, those are two of the most common that we see come up before the TPO or any kind of resolutions to support for both of those applications. Um, and then we do have the U.S. Congress. That is where we're, once it gets passed, and all indications are that it will get passed. We just have to wait on the federal government to, to kind of do their job. Uh, the community project funding program that they have going on now. We are hoping to get $4 million for the Volvo roundabout through that. Uh, that's that's the current commitment from them through that bill. It just has to go through the Senate and then eventually be signed by the President. So that is another source that we do have. So when we find out that we want to what is it, how, what happens from there? Is that something you follow? Like how do we know? This so, right, so I've been staying very much in contact with Spanberger's office. We are no longer in as of December 31st, I believe, in Spanberger's district. But we, it does not change her support or commitment to that project. So it is still very much uh, in the bill. It, I've stayed in constant contact with her staff. So I actually got an email update about it yesterday. And I will continue to stay in touch with them. They send out an email pretty frequently about the status of the bill, whether it's moving or not moving. They will send me updates on it. But then once it gets awarded, we have to make sure that the project is in the right list as far as can it be awarded the, the federal money. It's got to be in the Transportation Improvement Program to just get the federal dollars at all. Um, and then having that money, if it doesn't cover the full cost of the project, we'll be able to leverage that funding for Smart Scale or any other funding source that we do have available to us. I love your afternoons. Optimism when you said it. So would this be where I'm um, about like EDF or IJA? Is this are those programs as well? No, so the reconnected community, I mean, I'm sorry, not the reconnected communities, the um, uh, community project funding through the U.S. Congress is separate from, that is a House Appropriations Committee item by itself that goes into a yearly appropriations bill from the federal government. Okay. So that's not tied so, to an infrastructure uh, bill or anything like that. Okay. And so, um, they, to answer your question, though, the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act is a federal program that is centered heavily on infrastructure, roads, bridges, water, wastewater infrastructure, and there are a plethora of um, funding programs that are emerging for that at the federal and state level as well. And DBF is designed primarily for critical infrastructure um, bridges, so there may be an opportunity there. And 
not all of it has to be that the bridges are deemed structurally deficient. There has been um, major maintenance um, funds awarded to structures as well. Last question. Um, oh, I was just going to suggest that we start transitioning to our new congressman right. uh, yep. to their office. Yep. And, and, all the and assume that, I, so I do have contact information with the staff, and I did reach out about his support of the Oilville project. Um, not being in his district at the time, their staff wasn't aware of some of the se 7th district projects. Um, so, but as soon as the new application comes around, because as Spanberger staff has alluded to, it will be a yearly application process, a yearly cycle, which is great. So that's more opportunities for us. Um, one thing we have to consider is that each representative, I believe, gets only 10 projects for their whole district. So we do need to weigh that as well, that <coughs> we can apply for anything, but you know, we need to, is it the best use of staff resources to apply for something we may not get on kind of a small project, or if we do have a big one, you know, if we'd have maybe known about it at the time, we could have asked for a small amount of money for the Ashland Road DDI, or another project that might become a priority between now and the next cycle. So it's something that we'll definitely work with on Representative Good and his staff. So that was a yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so a couple of the more common grants. The first one is reconnecting communities. Uh, we had talked about the Three Chop Road reconnection that kind of got lopped off by Route 288 when that was built. Um, the criteria for that is any road, street, or parkway, or any other facility that hasn't created a barrier to community access um, or economic development. And I underline that because that's really our driver for the application for 3Chop. It doesn't, there's no community really there now. There's just a few homes down 3Chop that can access Ashland Road pretty easily. Um, and then the other end of 3Chop or um, Tuckahoe, Little Tuckahoe Court, which uh, services Wawa, is, that's pretty, self-sufficient self so there's no community to really reconnect so our focus on that will be economic development um, the two types of grants under that are planning and capital construction the planning grant is more around some items that we've already done on the three chopper road reconnection feasibility studies some very very preliminary design on what would the bridge under 280 look like um, so we would probably be looking at the capital construction which is what it sounds like it's the it's the foot the bill of actually building the project there is a maximum award on this, I believe, of $20 million, which 3 Chop will be right at that number, potentially. Um, it's very, very the high-level high cost estimates. Not the tunnel under. Correct. Um, so we would be aiming for the capital construction portion of the Reconnecting Communities Grant. Another common one that we see a lot through the TPO for resolutions and support is safe streets and roads for all. Uh, the goal from FHWA is to reduce or eliminate roadway fatalities and serious injuries as a result of any crashes. Uh, the criteria here is about <laughs> creating safety plans and then implementing those safety plans. So it's really geared towards planning documents and then constructing the projects that are proposed out of those documents. <laughs> Our eligibility here is, I know there's a regional undertaking, Mr. Lumpkins, through the TPO, that there's, there may be a regional kind of safety action plan being undertaken. But Goochland can always undergo its own action plan, much like Richmond's Vision Zero. Uh, so we can look at countywide uh, or, or district-wide if we wanted to really hone down that specific to look at safety on our corridors and any projects that come out of that, we could then pursue um, implementation grants to actually build those projects. Do, do you all staff, do you have a recommendation? Because this grant is available for, I think, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, either the planning Still or the implementation. implementation. Right. We don't have enough of a We don't plan have any plan for any implementation. So we, we, so anything we would apply for right, would be right now would all be action plans grants to actually get the planning documents done um, right now fortunately Houston County does not have a serious problem with roadway fatalities which is good news but it does in terms of scoring for transportation funding it does tend to hurt us a little bit and if we don't have widespread issues of major areas of, of fatal or serious injury crashes then it's something that we'll need to weigh as far as um, but is, we is have areas like the village where walkability, we heard this, I heard this morning about you know, economic development, one of the challenges is lack of walkability in our village. So can you get a safe streets and roads all to help you create we, a, a we, safe walkability? And area? I think especially coming out of the small area plans, we might be able to kind of re springboard off of those and run into getting kind of a bike head facility, say for the center of a plan, to, to, to be specific. We might be able to get an action plan for something like that. So that's something that we certainly would want to look at.
And really the third, and I say the third federal source, is, is the third of the most common and one that we've used recently is the U.S. Congress House Appropriations Committee, uh, the Community Project Funding. It, it, it's a very broad application as far as the criteria. It's not, it doesn't have to be road projects, it doesn't have to be an intersection, it doesn't have to involve interstates. It, it can really be anything. And, it, and looking at the list, there's a variety of projects that have been put in the bill, especially in District 7, seeing uh, Representative Spanberger's list. So all we really have to do, and the only criteria we're held to, is just what is the benefit? We have to show that there's legitimate benefit as part of a project, which the Oldville Roundabout specifically that we did submit, we were able to show that there's backing up on I-64, which is a federal uh, facility. So we were able to show that it's really going to greatly impact the safety and improve the safety on a federal facility. So there's no requirement so it should be to a certain point in, in design? No, there, there's nothing like that. It's a very high-level application, to be completely honest. It, it didn't require nearly the level of detail that a smart scale or a revenue sharing or anything like that. It, it, it was very high-level. Would we improve our chances if we had more detail? And no, there is. Because so, it, is it a, Congress, a congressperson's decision whether to push it? So it's a congresswoman's or a congressman's decision which projects to support. Any supporting documents we can give help that decision. Once it makes the bill, the House Appropriations Committee and then full Congress, whether it's the House or the Senate, don't pick and choose projects. It's either they're all in or they're all out. Okay. So any supporting documents would really be geared towards the specific representative. So now it would be Representative Good and getting him the information he needs to support our project versus somebody else's. Okay. So moving on to some state funding sources. Yes. So you're saying that they, did you say they can do like 10 a year? For each cycle, I believe the number is 10 that each representative gets out of regardless their entire of the district. Cost. Regardless of there is a maximum award, I believe, for highway projects, it is $7 million, which we did ask for less than that. The award caps are not quite what you, they're not as high as you may think they are. Um, go ahead. But you had a second yeah, thought. Okay. Um, there's also other types of, there's, there's bridge, there's engineering, uh, there's rail, there's all sorts of transit uh, opportunities through there. It's, um, but the, the highway one specifically, it's a $7 million cap, and total across not just highway, but including all the categories, they get 10 to choose from each representative. So is that something we could potentially uh, request for our weight-limited bridges? That certainly is an opportunity. Um, it, like I said, the criteria for this is very loose. It's the, there's no, it can only be or you have to have this many crashes, or it has to meet this safety level, or it has to have this well, level yeah. of service. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a safety issue. Right. Our, you know, our EMS right. <clears throat> but I guess there, there's no minimum, so we don't have to worry about, oh, well, that bridge doesn't score quite enough just yet. We have to wait a couple more years for it to get worse. So we could submit, we, we could certainly look at submitting those through that. <laughs> All right. Thanks. So that's certainly something we can do. So some of the state funding sources. So. Pretty much all the state funding sources are administered through VDOT, and the ones we're going to talk about today are the smart scale, uh, revenue sharing, one we haven't taken advantage of before, and I, I hope to, is the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Uh, VDOT will touch on some of that uh, in, in, in a little bit more specifics. The state of good repair for the bridges, which I know we've talked about in the past, and then also the um, secondary six-year plan. So smart scale, the criteria for this is it has to be a highway capacity improvement, which is what's on VTRANS. That's what VTRANS kind of tells the localities. Here's where we see your priorities are as far as what your capacity needs are. Um, transit and rail expansion, bike pet improvements, and then transportation demand management, which is parking lots. Um, Goochland projects, so in, in 2022, we did submit the following projects, the Oilville Roundabout, the Ashland Road DDI, Broad Street and Route 288 improvements, as well as the Hoggett Road realignment. So in revenue sharing, uh, it, it's a very broad criteria for eligibility. It's really a matter of do we have the money to support the application or not, because it is a 50-50 split between the state and the locality. Uh, this goes to touching on the Fairground Road extension, Mr. Spoonhauer, which we can certainly delve into whatever questions you may have on that. Um, and we can certainly take this revenue sharing and apply it to a lot of projects moving forward because the criteria is so loose, but we have to have 50% of the funding and commit to that up front. So did you want to touch on anything fairground specific? Um, I believe I heard you mention that we have another meeting in March in order to talk about sort of actual projects and timing. Correct. That's, that's the intent of the March one. 
does that <coughs> does that align with dates for submission of applications? So you so, have to miss out or have correct. Okay. Correct. So part of there's no deadlines between now and late spring, mid spring, late spring. So and the projects, the, the deadlines that we have between now and then are projects that we will be resubmitting. So a lot of the legwork's already been done. We might be refining. So it sounds to me, Ashton wrote over, I'm sorry, the fair rounds extension. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I don't know if it's a resubmission, so maybe we're, are we planning on resubmitting that? Or maybe, maybe just five minutes on where we are with that. So where the fair ground road extension projects, as, as, as a whole, kind of where it stands now, we received um, revenue sharing on that, and we have a commitment. The total revenue sharing, I believe, is $4.8 million. We have, as a county, another $1.3 million in the bank just because we, uh, that was a part of the resolution that was passed back in 19, I believe, was the original So is the 4.8 powered half? That's total. So 2.4 of ours, 2.4 of the state, plus we, as a county, decided to throw in, I believe, another 1.3. We're still, so that brings it just shy of $6 million, or right at $6 million. We're a little shy on the total cost from the most recent estimate. I'm happy to share those specifics with you from the most recent estimate. I don't have those in front of me right now. Um, but the, the, the estimate did go up approximately the same amount the roundabout went up, about 30%, because they looked at it using the new microscopes that they're looking at with everything across the region, inflation, market conditions, so on. So does, so does their 50%, does VDOT's 50% match up as well with the states? So revenue sharing is a one-time application. So we asked for X amount then, we would have to reapply for any more revenue sharing funds. So we asked for the current cost estimate back in 2019 of just shy of $5 million, and we were awarded that. But unfortunately, the cost had gone up. So that's where that project sits right now. And that extra 1.1, wasn't that our decision because of the fancy lights and the sidewalks and all that? And that had a lot to do with it. There was a lot of betterments being requested. Um, and that is currently baked into the new estimate and the estimate is still above what is totally allocated, both state and local. It is, I have to get you the specifics, but it's in and around, it's north of six and a half million, I believe. I'm, I'm happy to also share that brand new estimate and, and well, the details. Right? What was that? Well, we have 6.2, so we're only off by a very small amount, right? It is closer to a million dollars. I will have to look at the actual estimate that I got back from VDOT. I, I don't have the exact specifics, but it is closer to a million dollar shortfall. This, this is great. So, what's the plan for that? Nick, you're gonna, I can I can read you guys the numbers right now. Yeah, if you have a bill, that'd be great. Yes, definitely. So, definitely. Yes. Uh, there's four point about four point five million dollars allocated to the extension project, and the estimate is sitting at six point eight. So that has a two point three million dollar gap. And as a and that does not it's include not the count. extra one point one point three that the county decided to throw in as a part of the betterments to kind of cover what was going to be an anticipated cost overrun, I'm sure, but the cost went above and beyond that because of again, they looked at it in the same light as they did the roundabout, which is why the cost went up about the same amount as thirty percent. That's what the region has seen. So it's about a make roughly give or take a million dollar delta Correct. at this point. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good yes. Um, definition of locality and I think uh, I'm still going to ask you the questions um, <laughs> if we find don't do that if, if, funding, don't if we find funding, funding, funding sources locality might be <laughs> is locality 100% tax dollars or it, if we find means to fund it from a local source well, because we, we can attribute <clears throat> need for road projects directly to certain development projects so revenue sharing is sort of unique in that you can't use another funding source to cover our 50%. So we can't apply for smart scale funds to cover our 50% of the local match of revenue sharing. That has to be a true local dollar. Now, there are some other local sources available to us with CBTA. We can use those types of funds because they are for local localities to use on transportation projects pretty broadly. Correct. So, 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 so I'm sorry. one piece to know this proffers could be considered local dollars. Correct. At when they come in because it's not a tax it's a proper condition so that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking of revenue sharing so then the, the, the my question would be mm -hmm. do do are there options between now and march that we want to apply for that you need this board to agree to 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 close this gap to get this done 
or do we not see that as an option and waiting until March is the most prudent? I believe waiting to March is the most prudent thing to do. There are no application windows between that we could use to cover the okay. remainder between now and March. Okay, so that's a good update. We're not. But how about decision points in terms of letting me not know that we're continuing with the project? So we have had that discussion with them and the project manager. Um, I've told him that it's not. It, it's kind of in a holding pattern, and I know we had touched on this uh, a few months ago. I know, and Ms. Laska, you had brought this up specifically that you wanted to wait until we get the fairground road study done to see if we could better spend those dollars we have to, for the extension on a safety this, project part of the equation. which i do think is the appropriate thing to do is to kind of hit pause because they, they both impact fairgrounds road but is our safety needs yeah, on both sides of the right about. but to the board our safety needs on the current fairgrounds road going to take precedent over an extension and a nice extension to Route six is is going to be the question so i think for the extension to really have an answer for that, we, we may want to wait on the study to be finalized and really review those proposals as far as safety improvements or capacity improvements. And VDOT, we have the time from VDOT, it's like no decision needs to be made. We can, Correct. That, that can happen. We can complete the safety. Correct. There's, there's no deadline imminent that's going to affect the revenue sharing funding. It does eventually run out, so we will eventually have to make a decision on it. But I'm sure, and Philip, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure we could work with VDOT to, to push funding if to, to push it to another fiscal year with revenue sharing if we're kind of on the cusp of making that decision. But, but what about if the Fairground Road uh, study, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we are having accidents there, people right. dying on Fairground Road. Um, so if we decide that is a more urgent project, more important for safety reasons mm -hmm. rather than doing the extension. Mm -hmm. Can any of this money go up there? The local money, yes. The state half the 50% that they've contributed to 2.3 would would be, it, we would essentially let it expire in the revenue sharing system. And then could we reapply? I, and I don't even know if the studies on the right, right, right. But whatever improvements they suggest. Right. Um, could we then reapply? Would that be a revenue sharing project? Or would that be a smart scale project? We could certainly look at any avenues that we have available to us for that project. It's not because we've done revenue sharing in the past. We have to now do that moving forward. If we don't, if we need more money, we can look at smart scale. We can look at any other source that we have available to us. So we have three point seven ish money ish. of our money <clears throat> sitting here, and that can be moved if the board decides. That can be moved to anything, frankly. Not even transportation related. That can be moved to anything the board sees fit because that is local money. Mr. Pete, I was just going to say if the study identifies safety issues, mm -hmm. is that federal safety money come into play? Well, and that's one thing that Vito was going to touch on a little, in a little bit more detail in regards to I think the next state source, which is yes, the next one, the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Well, that's right. one we haven't used yet. But that safe streets one we already covered at the federal level. And that one could as well. Um, that's something that we can certainly see what the pro what the proposals are coming out of the study. Then we wouldn't have to raise the funding off of this project. I'm not if saying I'm not suggesting we do. I'm just trying yeah, to find my options. If we identify safety issues, then that might open up other buckets that are targeted right. for safety. And, and that's certainly a consideration. We, we may look at, just as an example, maybe fairgrounds. The study is going to call for a, a final answer of center line rumble strips from one end to the other. Let's let's say that's what comes out of it. We can take that and, and run through either one of the state or the federal safety sources, certainly. And we, and we may not have to strip the funding. And that's something that will come as a part of, I don't know if the March workshop will get into the project specifics, running through the CIP, kind of creating that six-year prioritization plan. I don't know if any of that would include stripping money from one thing to another. I think we kind of look at it, at least from a staff level. It's already there, so where else can we potentially get some money from? But if the board wants to make any action, then Feel free. Uh, yeah, again, I'm just trying to figure out what our options right. are. Right. Okay. Um, question on the yeah, extension. Yeah. Have, have we have we expended money? There's been zero money out of that account expended. So so there's been no design PE work or anything. There has been some done, but the Who's total. Paid for it? What was that? Who has paid for that? Uh, we have Tom. I know you. I won't yeah, let yeah, you touch in on that. That side. actually that project has been to public hearing with some um, some and I would have to get back with you on the funding source for that. For that. So we spent some money, but we, so, because where, where this question was leading was if we decide to pony up to 
remaining deficit mm -hmm. have because this thing has been I think it's been frustrating for us because every time we turn around it seems like the crisis is right so I was kind of wondering where are we in terms of like we bite the bullet again and we say let's pay for it how long till it gets to on the street for a bit so if we if we were to cover the 1.1 million dollar deficit today if that was a board decision at the next hearing in January then what that would do is allow the project to go through full engineering and get to bid. So there is an opportunity for the cost to go up again at bid, as we saw with the roundabout. Having said that, VDOT's new estimating tool covers a lot of those things that were getting caught at the bid. So there, it's a very conservative estimate now. So I would, I would be somewhat confident in saying that the estimate is solid in comparison to what we'd see at bid for the extension project. This is a 2019 bid. I mean, not uh, estimate. No, the current 6.8 or 6.9 million dollar estimate is a 2022 estimate. Oh, sweet. Because it's been updated. That's, that's why it keeps tying up. Okay. The, the revenue sharing application from 2019 was off of a 2019 estimate of around four and a half million dollars. Okay, makes sense. Well, I knew part of it was, again, what Goochland wanted to do in uh, improvements, if you want to write that. Okay. Um, we could yes. probably shorten this meeting by 15 or 20 minutes. If we had, here's the top 10 projects, yep. here's the cost, yep. here's the federal, state, and local monies identified to date, and here's the timing. It's either half funded, fully funded, quarter funded to hit the street next year, two years, three years. There's a top 10 project where it stands in funded. Because a lot of these questions are around. Well, and, and that's was sort of the intent for the March workshop is to do just that. It's take the CIP and run through what's available for the next six years and, and what are the priorities for the staff's recommendation as far as priorities over the next six years for the for all the application cycles. Sure, yeah, and I'm, yes, uh, I understand in March we're going to we'll be asked to consider taking action and prioritizing and making decisions. Uh, as far as update meetings like this, it take two minutes just to update here's the project, here's where it stands. Might short this a little bit. Anyway, just a thought. So the Highway Safety Improvement Program, I'm going to touch on it briefly, and then I know VDOT's going to chime in on um, how we can, specifically this program, how the Fairground Road study may actually, um, we, we may actually get some funding out of for those projects. Um, the criteria here, the project must improve safety on the public roads. Uh, VDOT advances any projects that have the greatest potential to reduce the state's roadway fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, and I know one thing the corridor study looked at on Fairgrounds Road was safety crashes where people run off the road, which I think was a big part of any safety improvements that they're going to make, which I think is very important. Um, so with that, Philip, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of touch on what we had talked about earlier. Yeah, so if you guys bear with me for just a second, I'm going to give you the quick and dirty um, history lesson on the HSIP program. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, this program was really used for spot improvement projects. So spot improvement would be a roundabout at, let's call it fairgrounds in 522, or um, a turn lane somewhere, you know, something, a specific location, um, some kind of improvement to, to the highway system. Then in the last, I think 2019, um, we had a, a change in direction where we were only using HSIP funds for systemic improvements. Um, those systemic improvements included eight different uh, types of improvements. That was high visibility um, back plates on signals, um, center line rumble strips, uh, pedestrian crossings, flashing yellow arrows, uh, that, that kind of improvement. That's what the direction that we went. So all of the money was being funneled into uh, those type of improvements. And those those were all being um, completed with, uh, for the most part, with uh, on-call consultants by, by VDOT. So then, in the last six months, the department kind of realized that there was some excess funding um, in the HSIP pot. And so we are going back to a, or we're re-reviewing uh, potential spot improvement projects. Uh, so uh, the district put together a list of different projects that, um, you know, they submitted to the central office uh, with a cost estimate um, and a implementation schedule. Uh, some of those improvements included guardrail, uh, temporary roundabouts, permanent roundabouts, 
um, ITS technology improvements, all sorts of things, signal timings, um, improvements, uh, so a bunch of different things. But they submitted that, and then it will be scored by the central office traffic engineering division on a benefit, benefit cost ratio. And then after the BC comes out, they will allocate that money to the different districts for those projects. So what does fairgrounds have to do with that? Some of the improvements that we're expecting to see come out of fairgrounds include um, centerline rumbles and uh, potential guardrail at certain locations around about uh, potentially some kind of improvement at, um, at uh, 632 and 634. Uh, so that's going to be the legwork of what type of improvements does fairground need, and then how does that fit within spot improvements or even uh, the systemic improvements, improvements because that that piece is still happening. We're just adding a, another another piece to the puzzle of H shift um, with the spot improvements. So um, there is no application for uh, H shift. It is um, controlled by the Traffic Engineering Division at VDOT and Central Office. Again, they look at a BC ratio to help determine where that funding is going to go. But absolutely doing these kind of studies and getting the input from the board is incredibly helpful to determine where the priorities are uh, and what we need to be submitting and, and really advocating for. Uh, so ho hopefully that kind of um, sheds some light on the HSIP program. Um, and, and the possibilities uh, for funding. Yes. Any questions? Incredibly helpful. Is there a time frame for these applications? How does that work? So, so, so there is no application. Um, there was, a, like I said, a list uh, that we developed and submitted to our central office. Um, we did that probably about four months ago. Um, so there, there is no real deadline, but you know when we do these kind of things, you know having this kind of study in our back pocket of uh, you know a gambit of improvements along the corridor is just really helpful to determine this is this is what we should include on the list uh, and, and submit to the central office. So um, thank you, Mr. Lawrence. And and I will add one piece. Sorry, uh, I mentioned guardrail. <laughs> I talked to some folks and they said not a single guardrail project was funded through the recent submission of HSIP uh, spot improvement projects. So I threw it out there because it is something that we have identified as, as a good safety improvement, but um, whether it doesn't score well, I don't, I don't really know the reasoning behind those aren't getting funded, but um, we have not seen those be incredibly successful. Um, so I would, I might have the obvious answer. Um, is this 100% reactive? Is there, if, if we envision a project to come that involves our roads, a roundabout, anything like that, that um, would be a part of the total project cost, can we reach out and say, this is the number of people we expect to see in this thoroughfare every single day, this is what we do, it, it doesn't, it sounds like it's totally reactive. And then secondly, I hope someone will send that last bullet point to the governor's administration because we get penalized for being too safe in many ways. Um, and transportation as a whole funding is generally more reactive than it is proactive. And that's a general source of frustration for staff, policymakers, so on and so forth. It's, that's it as a whole. I think that having these types of studies like we're doing on Fairgrounds Road is as proactive as we can possibly be because we say, hey, yeah, we've had issues here in the past. Maybe it's a spot where there hasn't been a fatality. We really want to prevent that. So our job as staff is to work with our residency in the district to prioritize a project on Fairgrounds Road that might come out of the study that, hey, look, we've had a lot of bad crashes here. Thank God nobody's died, but we really want to prevent that. So it's, it's about really coordinating. It goes back to the collaboration that we just need to walk hand in hand with our residency because they're our best advocate for the state to be able to get things prioritized. So the state of good repair, which we kind of touched on a little bit earlier, is 
for us, it's really about getting bridges funded that are what's called structurally deficient. Uh, we have quite a few bridges in this county. We have 31 that are listed as either poor or cusp condition. So they're almost there to structurally deficient, but they're not quite there. Um, one thing to note is that the bridges, in order to qualify for this source of money, have to be on the National Bridge Inventory, and not all of our bridges are. So that's something that we'll have to look at. And just like HSIP, this is no application window. This is a lot of coordination. Once there's inspections done, especially on our poor and cusp bridges, the inspections happen, I believe, yearly. Uh, Whitehall Road, for example, going over Whitehall Creek is one that just happened in February of 2022. I believe Tapscott Road had a bridge done in 2022. Those are both, I believe, poor condition bridges, so they'll be re-inspected very frequently. And as soon as the condition changes, staff will know, VDOT will know, and we'll work together to get that prioritized on a list for SGR funding. What's the difference between poor and cusp? Philip, is cusp worse? <laughs> is cusp worse than poor? Than, than poor. No. Okay. So, and this is perfect segue for me to jump in. Um, so. There are two bridges, and I say bridges, there are two structures in Goochland County that are considered structurally deficient. The first one is often mentioned, Pat Scott, that is actually a culvert, I think it's a box culvert. Um, that one is considered structurally deficient, and then the other one is actually Whitehall Road, um, which I know that there was an inspection done, and it showed that it was in poor condition and that it was not structurally deficient. That is a mistake. Um, we are getting that up, that um, that report updated. Awesome. I'm going to send you okay. an updated version of that report. Okay, perfect. Um, but that structure is in fact structurally deficient. So what we do is every year we put a list together, similar to the HSIP program, but we put a list of the bridges and or structures throughout our district. Um, that are considered structurally deficient, and we submit that to our central office with our um, estimated repair cost and what we're going to do to get it off of the structurally deficient list. Uh, at that point, the uh, locality, or sorry, the locality, the central office uh, reviews our list and they divvy out um, SGR, state of good repair funds, um, to the districts to fund those improvement projects. Uh, so, what I would say is um, the first one, Tab Scott, was on that list and it was requested for upcoming funding over the next six years. Uh, they could, with it being a box cover, they'll either be sleeved or it'll be replaced in kind. Um, but what was not on there was Whitehall. And um, I am actually working on getting that list updated so that it, it makes it on the request for funding because it should have been on there. So I apologize for that, but um, we're we're going to keep a better eye on it. And to answer your original question, Austin, mm -hmm. uh, cusp, cusp means it's getting close to becoming structurally deficient. Okay. Um, poor, poor means that one of the three categories, um, so it's your substructure, your superstructure, and your deck, one of those is considered a four. It's a scoring of zero to nine, nine being excellent, zero being fail. Um, or is considered a poor, and that means it is officially structurally deficient. So uh, a bridge could have a nine in two of the categories and be a four in third, and it will be considered structurally deficient. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, maybe uh, it's a side conversation we can have later, but I'd, I'd like to understand when we weight limit the bridge, what does that mean as far as its, its category or? structurally deficient or not. And I can come back to you. Yeah, we can have a sidebar discussion on that, but I know weight limits have nothing to do with, I guess, the deficiency or the structure itself. It's it's about the type of construction, the ground it sits on. Whitehall Road in particular, it sits on suspect soils. So even if it was the best built bridge in the world, it's sitting on suspect soil. So that's why that bridge in particular has a weight limit. And I'm particularly uh, concerned about Old Colony Road. Right. Because that causes fire engines to go right. like five miles. We've got way. three, and we've touched on this previously, but yeah. we've got three bridges. I think we have five total weight limit. Three of them really impact fire response yes. times. It's Tapscott's, um, it's Old Columbia, and Whitehall. Or I think there's also one of Haskins that may be also a problem. So there's three or four that really impact fire response times. And 
whether once they get to a point of SGR, staff and VDOT, we're going to push for that to be included on any funding list and request to be replaced or significantly improved to to be determined if those improvements make it no longer weight limited. It's it, it's kind of how they intend on taking it off the structurally deficient yeah. list. So, so, so short version is SGR funds cannot be used to help us get a bridge to increase weight capacity. For like the fire, fire truck can for safety. Yeah, fire truck can't cross this bridge because of the weight limits. SGR funds doesn't touch that. At, right? at our last meeting with um, Philip, some other folks at VDOT, and Dale Todd, who's the acting um, district he's, engineer. He's now the district. Is he actually he's from, the formerly the district engineer? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So when we met with him, I had brought up that question specifically, and because it, I had heard, he, think through a third party consultant, we were thinking about working when we were studying the weight limit bridges or looking to study them about, are they really weight limit or, or is the weight limit a little off? Um, I had asked that question to him and it, it seems that if the bridge, they won't replace it in kind, I don't believe, especially because Whitehall specifically is a timber built and they really don't do that anymore. It's all concrete built. So SGR funds in that specific case may make it no longer weight limited but that's not really the intent of them, is to bring a weight limit bridge up right. and, and increase that limit. That's what I think it might be a happy coincidence and a circumstance of the construction. Okay, so, one, one, yes. One piece I'll just add, um, when a when bridge starts to become structurally deficient, we do an annual inspection, so it goes from maybe every other year to every year. Uh, and if um, some things that we can do, we can do with state forces to uh, get the bridge off of a deficient list. So just because it becomes deficient doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that it is automatically being um, considered for replacement. It might be there's just an issue with the debt that um, we can prepare with maintenance funds and get it back to an acceptable level where it's not deficient any longer. Um, so just wanted to throw that out as a caveat that as soon as it becomes structurally deficient, doesn't mean that it's automatically getting replacement funds to bring the bridge up to current standards um, and, and current weight restriction requirements. Uh, so, and and I do apologize. I might I'm gonna have to step out for a few minutes. I got a, a 911 call, so I gotta just take a break. But um, I will be back in a few minutes if I need to answer any more questions. Thanks, so, thanks, thanks all. All right. The um, one of the last state fundings we're going to touch on is the six-year improvement plan. So any project that has funding attached to it or also the source goes on VDOT's six-year improvement plan to kind of track that funding and expenditure and so on. Um, we do receive funds allocated directly to Guzman County in the six-year plan for really small projects, rural rustic being one of them, where we're talking about doing Ben Lamont now. Guzman gets a very small chunk of money added to our little rural rustic pot every year. And once we get enough in that, we'll, uh, we'll tackle one of the rural rustic roads that needs paving. I th we're really just down to the one. So then it's, we'll have conversations about, can we move that money around? But, so that's an avenue that we're able to bring a lot of our gravel roads up to paving spec. Herndon, is that one? No, so Herndon, that, that's a little bit different. And that's actually what I'm about to touch on right here. Uh, we also get little bits of money every year into our rural addition program, oh, yeah. which yeah. is it's to bring private roads into the state system. There's a whole process that has to follow through, and I have been in touch with that citizen in particular about that process. It's it's rather lengthy, but he seems game for, for that process. And it's actually the second request I've gotten in a month for, to go through the rural addition process. Um, there's a couple of limitations on it. We only get so much. We can't bring a really long private road into the system or improve it to a point where it's the Taj Mahal of roads because we can only spend a certain percentage of our, we can only add a certain percentage of our total mileage and we can only spend a certain percentage of our total maintenance allocation that we get um, as a county. So we can't all of a sudden in one year decide to bring all of our roads into the state system because it would exceed some of those criteria. I don't. The two cases I've gotten in contact with, I don't know if both of them combined would kick us over one of these. That's something I need to look at because 1.25% of the county mileage is probably going to be less than we think when it comes to the total mileage that we may be adding because Herndon's got some length as well as the other road that escapes me now, the name of it. But well, that's something we'll have to take a look at as far as those asks every year. And so there may be prioritization needed from the board. Which one do we tackle first and which one next? Do we include the airstate? What's in Goose as far as the mileage? 
Um, I don't believe so. I believe that's the total mileage of the secondary system, but I will confirm that. So, touching on regional funding sources, um, there's really two that we utilize very frequently, and I think there's really only the two that are available to us, it's the TPO and the CBTA. Um, regional bodies administer their own funds as well as they administer federal funds given to them. Uh, the TPO really administers federal projects, whether it be the RSTBG program or CMAC. Those are all federal dollars, but they're administered regionally. And CBTA is strictly administering their own funds. So it's strictly regional funds staying within the region. The TPO has the two programs that I just touched on. The first one is the Regional Surface Transportation Block Grant. It's really flexible funding for any kind of transportation project. There's only a couple real caveats. It must be located within the MPO boundary, and it must be located what's on the federal aid highway system which really takes care of all of our primary arterial routes, any interstate project, uh, ramps, things like that. So it's, it's not so much geared towards a lot of secondary roads. Uh, Hockett Road Realignment is the only one we've taken advantage of this one in, in the near future. Um, but that's eligible because it's on Broad Street. It's on one of our primary roads. Um, the second, let me get the thing over here. There we go. The TPO also has the CMAC, uh, Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality. Projects must be what's in, called, what's in the uh, eight-hour ozone non-attainment area, and that is specifically laid out in federal code. We currently, no part of Goochland County falls within that. It stops at the county line within our code. So Goochland County will not be eligible for any CMAC funds until a portion of that our county gets in with it gets within that eight-hour ozone area. I don't know. You're saying that's not something you want. That's yeah. not. That is certainly that's not, not a goal. A goal to that is certainly not a goal. <laughs> So the TPO also administers the Transportation Alternatives Program, which we went through for the Eastern Trail. We had some funding attached to that project through TAP. Uh, it's for on and off-road pedestrian and bicycle facilities, improving non-driver access to public transportation and enhancing mobility. Um, I know, like I said, we had talked about the Eastern Trail a lot in the past, and that was a project that we utilized TAP funds. If we choose to in the future, I know in one of the small area draft plans, currently they're talking about a Courthouse Creek Trail, walking through the floodplain here. Maybe that's something that we pursue TAP funds for. We've got other avenues for bike pet facilities, but this is one that's specifically bike pet. Um, and then also, we have a lot of spotty sidewalks in the Courthouse Village. This would be an avenue we could complete those sidewalks if we so chose, because that's a bike pet facility. So that's something that we could explore as well. Can we locally, locally administer a project that comes from TAP funds? Yes, we were locally administering the Eastern Trail project. Um, so we can request VDOT to administer these, or we can locally administer them. Um, the yeah, only caveat is. Go ahead. For the extension, Fairbairn Road extension. No, the additional money, the 1.2 or 1.3, mm -hmm. was for the, the fancy the lines the, and the yeah. sidewalks. Yep. Could that I would have to dig into that. I don't know if a bike ped facility that's a part of a that's a I don't know if those facilities because they're a part of another linear project, the road extension, if they could be separated in that regard. Just that's something that I can sort of look into and get you an answer on that. But I don't know the answer right now. Um, and one of the caveats with tap funds, um, one of the caveats is there's a 20% local match required. So any. Well, we're doing 100% now. 20 is looking good. The other regional source is the CBTA, the Central Regional Transportation Authority. So the funding from that comes from local and regional. I won't change it. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, the CBTA collects taxes on gas and sales tax in the region, uh, percentages and, and the amounts are shown there. And the CBTA administers really two pools of funds, the regional funds, which is a competitive process, application process, to get awarded those funds, and then also the local funds. The regional funds are 35% of the total allocation through the CBTA, and they're awarded to several different uh, categories. It's highway, bridge, bike pet, studies and then engineering only. I've highlighted the three there because those are the three that we've taken advantage of in the past. Highway, studies, and then engineering only. 
get to where we go. So highway, the current criteria is pretty straightforward. It's got to be on a limited access roadway, which is IE or interstates or freeways, so Route 288 and 64 in Goochland. Any existing or proposed roads that will have daily trips of 20,000 vehicles, which is quite a lot. And four, it's got to be located on what's called a corridor of statewide significance. So in this county, we have all of Broad Street and then Route 6 from the county line to West Creek Parkway. Those are our two corridors with statewide significance. So any project on those corridors in those areas would automatically be eligible under the current CBTA rules. County line and the west. All the west, right? For Broad west. Street, it's county line to county line. And then for Route 6, it's the Henrico County line to West Creek Parkway. The rest of Route 6 is not what's called oh, a corridor statewide significance. Correct. Such thing. Okay. And it's not also on the area of our arterial preservation network. It's the same sections for us as well. Um, there may be, I'm hoping that we get some revised criteria out of the CBTA to expand our eligibility as well as some of the other small localities. Um, the thought is we keep all the additional, or excuse me, all the existing criteria for some of the bigger localities while having a few caveat carve-outs for the small localities that, frankly, we just won't reach 20,000 vehicles exactly. today. The only sections of our roads that have that volume is Broad Street from 288 to Henrico, and then Route 6 from 288 to Henrico. Those are the only two very short sections of our roads that even hit that threshold. So our goal is really to increase our eligibility. Staff's goal is to, for example, it's Ashland Road, potentially Oldville Road, Fairgrounds Road, if we can get it, US 522 from end to end. So those are the goals that we're kind of working towards. Currently. How's that going? I think very well. Okay. Right now it stands, and I'm happy to have a sidebar kind of update with, with all the board members if, if that's desired on where that's going to stand before it gets adopted in case there's any feedback. But right now it's hopefully not expanding any rules for the in, I'll say internal to the Beltway communities, your Chesterfield, Richmond, Henrico, so on, and then ex really expanding. I, I think Gooshlin, I think, will come out ahead without allowing Henrico to kind of, you know, get, get, get away with murder. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you, this is under the category or under the heading of CBTA. Mm -hmm. Doesn't does this maybe potentially impact the TPO? No. This, 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 this is the regional availability of funds for the 35%. But might it, might it expand the definition of regional for the purposes of some of the things we do in the TPI? If other organizations wish to, wish to, I guess, review their definition of regional, um, that's certainly an option. I know this definition only specifically impacts the CBTA. For the 35%. Yeah, this is purely money. This, money is, CBTA right. this is just the check boxes on the application. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, so the new criteria will just be check boxes on an application for CBTA funds only. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so to date, we have been fortunate with CBTA regional funds. We've received $38.1 million thus far. Uh, chunk of change for the DDI at $33.7 million. Um, some anticipated cost overruns at Oldville. And then uh, a few dollars on the uh, Route 288 southbound hard shoulder running lane project, which we hope will expand the um, capacity and the traffic in uh, the West Creek area when, when that when that gets fully developed. Uh, before, before you yes. Mm -hmm. What about the Tweed Northbound? So that one I didn't include in this list as far as Goochland allocations because we didn't apply for that funding. VDOT did. Right. It is in Goochland. How much? So we're close to about fifty million, right? So if we add in the VDOT eight million dollar award that they brought to the table themselves plus the other eight million dollars they've asked for the cbta add 16 to that so we're north of 50 million dollars for goochland projects within the county right and the reason i want to bring this up i think it's very important while we often are on the short end of the stick as far as what we're awarded through some of these regional uh, entities <clears throat> our contribution is to date has been about two million dollars for that 35 percent pool and we're getting back close to 50. So my personal investments don't work that well. So we have been, the, the region has treated Lucent County very well. Uh, and so just want to make sure we call that out and appreciate yep. that. Oh yeah, I think we've been very successful. Yeah, it's super cool. Before you leave, we, we were, yeah. sorry, Jeff, because we, when this was launched, we said, we're just going to be a donor county, we'll mm -hmm. if we ever get a project. Absolutely. So, so we just going to give my money. the goal moving forward is to keep that traffic <laughs> going, where every, every cycle, we're, I hope to be just as successful with getting a lot of money. I'll rest on your shoulders. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, the formula leak because she talked about the CBA. Right? <laughs> talk and, and then, of course, there's 15% of chance for transit. Correct. Well, that's specific, you said transit. It specifically goes to GRCC. Yeah, correct. So um, just give us, a, give us a minute on, on where you are on, on the microtransit. And so microtransit. What, what should our role be? In so of right now it's been very little information from VDOT on microtransit. Um, the study, the presentation that I know they're slated to give, I think in the near future, is about uh, they're undergoing kind of a study. And I, it was two TAC meetings ago where they're talking about potentially expanding. Because I was like, yeah, let me okay. just finish that real quick. Though there might be full, GRTC is looking at actually expanding full access with lines as far west as um, on Broad Street on to um, Wilkes Ridge. So it may be coming as far west as 288. The pulse systems, they're, they're undertaking that now. If you want to touch on microtransit specifically. That's not the microtransit. No, so microtransit, they've got five localities that they're going to use what they're calling like a round one phase. And then they're looking, uh, we're, I think we're included in the round two phase of a potential study, uh, really kind of looking at small vehicles, more call and ride kind of you know, uh, transportation options, not sending buses out here. but. Kind of like almost like an Uber. Okay. Average price is about six dollars. Uh, it's very, very narrowly defined for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, as far as where it would be eligible, but we're looking for the second round of that. And that was just that just came out Friday in the CBT. So when you say studies, are they looking at demand in these pockets? Yeah. So they're going to roll out and see, okay, who's using it, who's not. So they're going to find out demand by rolling out the program and see if anybody uses it. <laughs> if they don't, about it. So we're all in the we, we need to let folks down. So uh, it just goes back to the localities not having transportation departments, <coughs> like I said earlier. And I think some of the localities, some of the, some of the board of supervisors members in the localities have expressed concern about what we saw from the GRTC. I share that concern. <coughs> yeah, and so part of me, after seeing the presentation at the TPO, wants to just say stop stop and you told me something i didn't know they were talking about six dollars when they presented to us they they didn't have any idea what well, you did they yeah, said we all know we haven't thought about that but they did say that we want to be successful so then the next question is like well how about success how does that work monetarily if you don't even know what you're charging or whether you're charging it? But, and then they go back well it's just a level of service so then of course the level of service is that demand is that ridership I mean, you know the whole thing just Makes my head explode. But, <laughs> but I, I do think that there is, um, because again, no transportation departments in some of these smaller counties, and then I listen to board members expressing concern. I wonder if there's a disconnect between what GRTC is doing and what the county or the people in the community really. What was want it? or don't want. Well, well that's that's to, your, to your point, you know, we're all contributing counties to GRTC now based on CBT funding, 15% of that tax goes to GRTC. Mm -hmm. We have no services and we have no representation or funding on the board of GRTC. Uh, yeah. And I appreciate GRT. I, I don't know what all <clears throat> is really going on behind the scenes, but it seems like they want to acknowledge that the loca the, these rural localities that don't have any transit, <clears throat> they're contributing. So I appreciate them wanting to bring something, but it seems half-baked. I mean, it doesn't address the actual need. It doesn't talk to localities about. The, you talk they, about they did discussion. studies. They did studies. So, but but I, I well, doesn't I mean, address the. Talk to three people in Mitchell County. I mean, seriously. Yeah. When you talk about the disconnect, both of you have more information about microtransit than I've been presented at, at the different TAC levels. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm learning something here today about the microtransit that I didn't know before. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, so take it from with it's, me. It's, it's a serious problem. But. I, I do. I think I think this could use some board level participation, maybe with some other board members. I know, but see, everybody's different because out in Charles City, this maybe elements of this make sense because they have the potential to connect to I think Bay Transit, Bay Transit. or something, which connects okay. out to Gloucester or something like that. So, so I mean, there's a lot of different moving parts, but it, I think we would be well served by engaging a little bit more in the microtransit efforts. And it, it is a huge concern for my constituents. I get questions all the time. And when I literally came by there and I saw 
Gooch and Care's bus at the at the uh, mechanic shop, I'm hoping it's a for regular maintenance not broke down because a lot of people use I mean, it. It's a huge, huge issue. Yeah, but the issue is, is that we're going to get past this, but GOTC study doesn't include anything like Western Gooch and County. What the need is is the biggest. You're absolutely correct. The need and is not to ride not, around inside of a little circle in your. You know. yeah, basically, it's only the courthouse area. That's correct. all they want to do. You're you got to come from and go to the courthouse area. With no, it's not needs based. <coughs> so it's not like you're elderly or disabled or whatever. Not needs based. So it's. You know, and, and there's some problem. there's some other money, and I mean if it's really. This is where I think you, you touched on it's 5310 funds or something like that for, for the folks that need, need transportation. And, and we really need to explore that. I, I wonder if we could utilize some of that, some of this money that they want to contribute to you know, rural transit to maybe support where the real needs are, which and maybe supplement some other funding that is there for what I think maybe. Hanover has the DASH program or something like that. Maybe, that but it's not going to come out of the G GRTC money. I mean, they're not giving up with you their money. Well, they're just looking at some other things. They may not be They won't let us do it. I mean, they don't well, that's of, course, that's, of course, what our friend south of the river is saying. You know, give me my 15%. I can do better. Well, exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was going to say, this 5310 was mentioned in the, uh, the CARES program. They do apply for that money, and they do regularly get money to pay for vans. So it may be, um, if you're not familiar with it, maybe that's something we can find out some information mm -hmm. on how often they get that funding and the services they provide. I, I think that's a lot better option for us than a bus that just drives around the courthouse here. Right. So I think they use it for the senior connections program. Right. We give a recognition on that. Right. Yeah. <coughs> the only time remember my service on this where lack of public transportation really uh, was an issue was when they were thinking about building a hospital out here and there was no public transportation for the families to get from Richmond out to see their family members in the hospital. If Pulse came to with Wilkes Ridge and there was a shuttle from Shelfling Arms and possibly other real estate in there, it makes the hospital a lot more uh, you know, Advertising potential. And that makes, that's that makes what, sense. That's really the only one. An amphibious vehicle that can cross talk of a creek. <laughs> 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 you guys like we're not going to get a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just cross the bridge. They don't need that. <laughs> that's, that's the only time I can think where I really was a, a detriment on that application. Was, uh, there's no public transportation. Yeah. And, and that's, something, that, that's something I think we should jump, jump on. Uh, if, Centerville in that area is, is, yeah, Avery Point and all these things that are coming there. That's you know, going to be a need. There you'll have the ridership, I think, the potential ridership. I would imagine Avery Point's going to run their own bus system, too. So to what degree can we even capitalize upon that and make a partnership? If they're already running buses up and down, perhaps there can be some extra level of support from a program like GRTC into that. Yeah, they're going to be going to short time. Yeah. I mean, they're not coming Why back to I wouldn't think that. Well, the bus service only goes for seven dollars. <laughs> 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 Sorry. 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 It doesn't cross the county line. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a bus. Like <laughs> like <laughs> okay. Um. Sorry, we're no, that's we're not. This is y'all's. This is the board's meeting. No, what, um, micro, micro transit should be on. Be yeah, on your radar. No, that sounds great. The CEO's perspective. Why don't you and I go? Well, and, and to kind of finish off that, I know when we did OIP that they basically told us microtransit was never going to happen because it was there was no demand for it. They looked at the full bus service out this way and it obviously said it doesn't exist. Well, what's happening is GRTC <laughs> is providing free ridership right. because they've got a federal grant. Right. Therefore, they have some money now. Right. That's that's the that's the truth. That's what's happening. So. Look forward to see what comes out of all that. Um, yeah. So local funding sources. <laughs> We have the CBTA local, and we've got a couple of real local, really local options, cash proffers, and just cover all bases. We do have the county budget. Um, the CBTA, so 100% of the pot is, is divvied up to that 15, 35, and 50. 50% 50 of that money is distributed directly back to the localities based off how much we did contribute. Uh, the funds must be spent on transportation-related items. The language in that part of the state code is extremely broad. 
I know some localities pay their staff with their CBT and local funds, like the city of Richmond, that's what they do. Um, we receive approximately $200,000 per month. Our current account total is $4.2 million. We have utilized these funds in the past. We did the company one median, which I know has been a big hit with the fire department. They actually love that. Uh, we're using a lot, a little over half a million dollars of the local funds with the roundabout that's going in right now. Um, and then also $135,000 to the Opticom preemption devices on our existing signals. So once that's done, that's in design, at the tail end of design, it should be starting construction early 23. That will give us all of the emergency signal to turn the lights green on every signal pole we have in the county. So that will cover our, every existing signal we have will have those emergency beacons on them. All the same. All five of them. <laughs> <laughs> How much was the uh, company one median? The company one median, so the original proposal was $26,000. We got an invoice for less than that from VDOTS. Philip, if you have it, it was that. seventeen to nineteen thousand was the total actual cost of that project. So we, we came in about seven thousand dollars under budget. So we still have we have eight ish, seven to eight. Okay. That's all. Seven to eight. I'm gonna say I'm asking how much for that project or how much C V T funds do we have available to well, I, I was going to do the math, but I, I, ultimately I want to know current total is 4.2 million. That's Correct. after that's these projects. That's after those okay, projects have been paid. paid. Yes. Okay. So we do also have cash proffers at our disposal. Um, proffers that are collected through any rezoning case. Uh, we have allocated proffers before. We allocated a chunk of proffers. A lot of our old proffers that were set to expire, we went to the fair or a roundabout. And we were set to spend some of that on the East End Trail. So that is something that we can use on transportation related items as well to kind of almost as a gap funding. Um, now our property must be spent in the region, part of, in the part of the county that they were collected in, which does add a little bit of a caveat there, but I think that's important as well. Um, and then one of the last items is we do have the county budget that if there's a, a, a need that the board sees, uh, whether it's small or large, it can be proposed in the county budget. And just to cover all bases, it's it's on presentation. That's last time I see you laughing over there. Um, <laughs> it's an option. Yeah, it is. I, I wanted to cover any and all options. Um, and one thing we may do, if it's small allocations, just a few dollars here and there to help leverage some small projects for sidewalk completion or anything like that, that it, it certainly is an option. And, Local funds are the most broad. There's the least amount of rules, especially with county money. We can spend it on whatever we so please when it comes to transportation related items. I hate to say there's no rules, but it's pretty close. Um, so that's kind of an overview of all the funding sources. I know it was a lot to take in, um, but I wanted to go through all of these prior to the March one because it'll essentially be taking these sources and applying it to the CIP and providing staff recommendation for the next six years, application cycles, and so on. Um, the handout that's in the back of everybody's packet was the, it, it, that's the state's two-year cycle, what's on the even years, what's on the odd years. So that's essentially we'll be doing the same thing for federal and local. Uh, well, there's really no local deadlines unless they're self-imposed, but any federal deadlines we have, and that's how we're going to form that six-year plan. Um, and some future topics. Uh, we may be discussing are any educational opportunities the board may want or VDOT may propose to us. Uh, more than happy to get them in here. Uh, the next one will be the transportation CIP review. Uh, I really look forward to going over smart scale scoring. I'll probably be touching on that one in the March uh, workshop as well. And CBTA TPO scoring as all those uh, application windows close and then anything else the board sees fit between workshops. So like the smart scale, mm -hmm. you said the pre-application begins on March 1st. Right. Pre-application deadline is June 1st. Correct, so we have so three we months would we typically more go towards the end of that period? So for this last cycle, uh, we were very engaged from March to June, putting in the pre-application for uh, the Ashland Road DDI, uh, the, any smart scale application. So that's actually different than the pre-scoping I touched on earlier. Right. The pre-scoping has no deadlines. It's, it's right. you put in the information kind of when you want to know, when you want to get feedback. And then we, go, we can go from that pre-scoping portal into pre-application, which is a requirement for smart scale, that's kind of finding fatal flaws in your projects. And you, that's when we weed them down from five to four. Because we can have five pre-applications before total applications. That's when we do that, weed, that, that weeding process. So should we meet 
before March. I think you're looking at the wrong year, though. No. So next year will be an odd year. So smart scale is every other year. It's all even years. So this coming March, there is no smart scale windows. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so this coming, so this coming March, for example, the only thing that we have on the state schedule is the SSYP or the SYIP, the, the, the six-year plan, and that's when Philip will reach out to to, to me. Rep share, rep share, rep share is big next year, right? Yes, yes, it is. So that's the big one for next year. This past year was smart scale smart is kind scale. of its next own year. beast that they kind of want to cordon off on its own. Next year, we're, I mean, as we get around March, you're going to want to know what we're looking at for revenue share applications, right? Correct. Um, awesome. Hey, when we had that meeting in March, we were kind of talking about um, sort of strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we may not want to get sure, too much with secret sauce of how we get the product. <laughs> but understanding is this, you can only apply for one at a time, like we do the same project, so, you can apply for all these funding sources? That would be your recommendation that comes out of it. Is there, is there a project, let's take the actual for DDI, a lot of money, that's a big cost. We might not get all that through one source, so right. staff may come with a recommendation for another big project, hey, let's use these three, or these four next cycles for these four different opportunities, and, and go that route for a big project. Yeah, so it's, it's just a, a formal televised request that for a March meeting that we have as part of the conversation. Yep. Yep. Which is, okay, Again, around the strategy of how to do that. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of the relationship over the last year and a half that we've built with our VI partners Absolutely. and their ability to help inform us as we're learning this new world of regional cooperation or coopetition, as uh, Daryl Walter if you thought, would like to say, uh, <laughs> using NASCAR references. Um, but having that co to understand what's, what are good strategies to do this and, and really leveraging. Um, your help. So, Phil, right. thank you for those offers, and mm -hmm. I will be taking you up on that. So, with that, are there any, are there any other questions? questions? Any other comments about today or anything transportation related? Uh, Mr. Peterson. Yeah, I've got a few. <laughs> thank you. Okay. We're going to harvest that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Give me a Kermit cheer. You're going to have to feed me. <laughs> Yeah, it's a resource. Look, first of all, thank you very much for walking us through this. Yep. As we sit here, our job is we've got <coughs> funding sources and then we've got projects that we'd like to get done. Right. And in between is this complicated maze. Yes. And you're our Sherpa to try and get us to the chiefs, right, in this maze. And and the frustration, and you know, so listen, you know, some of the frustration is we end up with state and federal money that's allocated through a political process Correct. to advance political agendas, which we don't have in the locality. We just have safety and traffic moving and those kind of issues. And so as a consequence, we end up with extra money for things we don't care about and not nearly enough money for the things that are our high priorities because we have to go through that maze that starts out with a political agenda and ends up with us trying to do the best that we can. So I appreciate you and, and Vita guiding us through that base to try and maximize the utility. And then, so for me, at the end of the day, we have a master transportation plan that was done outside consultants that identified <coughs> on the maps with red and yellow and green, these intersections are failing, these intersections have all the accidents and fatalities, and I'm not sure how many People have to die before you get some money, but there's a, a metric in there. Well, for me, if we look at that map today of where the issues are, and then we access whatever pots of money we can, that three to five years from now, if we look at that same map, we've addressed some of those flashing red issues, and whether it's intersections or 288 backing up for three or four hours a day, but on average it's five. Uh, you know, have we addressed some of those issues? Um, recognize that we have reasonably clean air, don't have ozone, and we don't have a lot of fatalities, try to access some money anyway, because even if we have very few fatalities, if we have one at an intersection, we should try to do something to alleviate that. Right. It, it's, it's not a relative of enough of them, it, it's heading, and, and obviously prevent you know, yeah. these fatalities as well. So again, I come back to, we have these resources, <coughs> did we maximize the utility in terms of addressing the pressing issues on the citizen side, which is 
accidents, injuries, deaths, backups, inconvenience, whatever it is, are we are we successful in bringing those resources to bear to, to address the issues that are most pressing? And again, I come back to going through this process. It looks like we may have extra money for you know things that you just just it's interesting stuff, but uh, and then and then we're just not getting there on the stuff that we really really want to do. Right. Um, so for me, again, as we go through this process, you know, looping back to what are we trying to accomplish? I mean, I know we have private specific discussions about broad about and this and that, but what are we really trying to accomplish by doing these things as opposed to the project itself? We're trying to, the accomplishment isn't getting the side, sidewalks or the lights or the roundabout. The project is to address this need. And I want to continue to loop back to that need and say, are we really prioritizing on the right needs and the right mm -hmm. things as opposed to what is money available to do this, let's go do it. Um, you see where I'm going with all yep. this? And, and to that point, I think one thing that's very important that I actually hadn't pointed out yet, so thank you for sparking that in my brain, is that the six-year plan is certainly not set in stone for the next six years. We can only do this for the next six years. It will be a yearly <coughs> update with the board, whether it's in June at the end of a fiscal year. Maybe you don't want to tie it into budget conversations in, in, in June right before the end, but September, the, once we kind of shake the dust off of the new fiscal year, we have an update every year to address new priorities Perfect. and make sure we're on the right path. Perfect. So as we do that in, let's say, March, mm -hmm. it's here's the pockets of money available for these mm -hmm. projects, but this is what we're trying to accomplish by doing it. If you, if you add that piece to it, our mass transportation plan, these are the red areas we're going to turn yellow or green. These are the fatalities. These are the top 10. We have a share of producing once in a while, top 10, top 15, top 20, you know, incident-related areas of the county. So that can help focus our attention. What we try to accomplish as opposed to just to accomplish and get the project done, that's not really what we're trying to accomplish. It's a means to an end, I guess, is where I'm going. Mm -hmm. So if you could tie that piece to it, mm -hmm. Mark, that would be helpful for yep. the allocations. No, I think that, I think that would certainly help. Um, and one thing that I think would be helpful is uh, I'll coordinate with the sheriff and get some of that data really right up to the March Please meeting, do. because then we can look at is there an area that staff and the board haven't considered before that's all of a sudden become kind of a hot spot on the heat map, yeah. where is there a glaring red flashing beacon that nobody's seen yet? Please do, and that's one of the one of the ways we got the traffic lights at Broad and 288 uh, was it, it was on top of the list. So if each year we kind of take the top of the list off, we should be really improving the, the overall quality of, of, of life here in the county. Well, and then one thing with the yearly update, we'll be able to better shift our priorities because Project Rocky changed a lot of things and goose on as far as transportation priorities. Ashland Road, DDI, and the widening was certainly at the top of the list, but number one. <laughs> oh, overnight. And, and that's an excellent point as well, because I think that transportation study did project out into the future right. growth and whatnot, right. but as we try to grow gracefully, one of the things is to accommodate that growth without increasing accidents and without increasing traffic backups to try and build out and target what we need to accommodate that growth to make sure we grow gracefully yep. without creating problems. And, uh, and as far as we have, Philip, are you still there with us at VDOT? Oh, there he is. Philip, you still there? I am. I am still here. Sorry, I was leaning back in my chair. Yeah. <laughs> um, got a real quick one for you. Um, there's a big, speaking of state and federal political decisions, there's a big push to go with EVs going forward, electronic vehicles. And on average, what I've been able to tell is it adds about 1,000 pounds per vehicle. And if we've got about 8 million population, one vehicle per, that's about 8 billion additional pounds on the roads and bridges and tunnels. Uh, is VDOT allocating additional resources to pave more frequently or reinforce the bridges for a thousand pounds per vehicle going forward? I'll be honest, I, I, I don't think I'm quite the person to answer that question. I will say that we have um, okay. pushed resources to review how the transportation network is going to grow um, as part of the uh, electronic vehicles. One of the things that I can think of specifically that has been reviewed is um, a lot of these vehicles, if they're self-driving, they really depend on edge lines and striping to stay within lanes, and we don't have a lot of edge lines and striping on secondary roads. So um, those are the things that I've heard that, that VDOT is looking at as far as are we changing our design standards for, for bridge capacity and for um, how you know we build our roadways. Um, I haven't heard anything. I can pull some feelers out and see if we have. My guess is that in the in the long range plan, a thousand pounds per vehicle is probably 
kind of nominal um, to the lifespan of, of uh, our pavement and our bridges because those are live loads. They're not continuous loads. They are there and then they're gone. Um, but I can definitely go down that, that road and see if I can find any information for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, that'd be great. I mean, something wears out the roads and they need to be repaved. And I know a lot of it's, you know, freezing and thawing and that kind of thing, but when you add another 1,000 pounds per vehicle, that's got to chew them up faster. I just want to make sure that we don't fall behind on a resurfacing schedule um, with this big shift to EVs. I know you have less money to work with because the gasoline taxes will go away, but uh, we just have more, more money to spend. <laughs> we have higher expenses and less revenue, I guess, so everybody's got their challenges. But all right, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Well, Austin, I think, mm -hmm. and, and County Administrator, I think what, what it would help us when you were talking about the safety, I think about the safety, um, and mm -hmm. you mentioned Vision Zero in the city. One of the things that was a thought of TBO was to, was to do an application for a study grant. I think Chesterfield and then Riker sought for seeking Correct. implementation grants for their safety. One of, them was, one of them was seeking implementation, the other was action. I don't recall which was which. And, well, the city was seeking uh, an action, action grant because they had their Vision Zero in place. Correct. The others were seeking study grants. Yeah, but, but then, meanwhile, the regional plan didn't move forward because we weren't ready yet. And so Correct. That, and that would have been a, a, a study grant as well. What might help is if uh, our, you as our transportation folks, if you tell us how can we, in working with the region, um, because I was really a little frustrated. I'm like, okay, the, the localities are going to one's doing it, one's doing an, an action, the other two are doing studies, and the region, meanwhile, is not ready to do the study. So that just left me feeling like, well, that's kind of backwards. And so, is everybody going to do their own individual safety study? Well, it seems like it should be. This seems like an area that regional cooperation would make sense in terms of, that's right. in terms of uh, creating. Uh, so, in addition to just thinking, well, does Goochland need to do its own study? Do we want to even bother with any kind of plan, safety plan? I think it would also, instead of just asking that question and stopping there, with your role on your role with TAC and these others, is to guide us to say, you know what, uh, this is what Goochland's thinking, but here's what's happening in the region, and here's where somebody might want support. You know, some, some of the regions, because I think again. If we're going to do regional cooperation on the funding and all those other components, it'd be good for us as board members to know, going back to some of these places that don't have transportation departments, mm -hmm. I can tell you my sense is some of the county representatives are not as versed in the details of these things. So they're kind of catching up sometimes even in policy board meetings. And that's, I'm finding out, because I sometimes do the same, being chair, you kind of got to prepare for the meeting, so I'm like, true, true confessions here, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm reading ahead even more than I usually do, um, because I've, I've got to run the meeting, but it's, but it's been great, and what, what I've learned is like, I'm, I now, because the pieces make more sense when, you, when you're actually talking to the other leaders in front of you, right? so it's a long-winded way of saying, I think there's opportunities for us, for, for, for staff, to guide us in how to how to work with our regional partners. What are understanding these attack meetings? What's going on? What are they thinking about the safety plan? And maybe because uh, if I thought maybe I should have really pushed harder if, I, if I'd have known it was coming months earlier. Because we had a plan. I had no idea until the eve of that meeting that our plan wasn't far enough along to qualify for an implementation grant or an action grant. So I mean, keeping tabs on some of those things, I know it's, you've got a long list already, but I would add those things to the list because I think we can become better regional partners mm -hmm. and maybe maybe we'll find out, you know what, our efforts should be spent pushing for a regional safety right. plan versus Kuchin trying to do it on its own. Well, that, would, then, that would get us more benefit. Right. And then part of that is making sure if we undertake safety studies on specific streets or on the road or if we do one after the small area plan kind of thing, as Maybe that starts to take some, gain some steps and, and start to be built out. And we start to see the Centerville Village become more of a <coughs> built out community. We can look at prioritizing in a regional plan some needs that we see because we're the only ones that can call that out. If the region takes a 20,000 foot look at Goochland County, they're, no, they're fine. They might not see any needs, but it, it'll be up to the staff and, and any member on the policy board to really yell about that if we have any needs to get those 
into any regional plans, and the long range transporta transportation plan as well. Yeah. We see needs that a region or the state might not see in Movement County, and we, it's, it's up to us to really drive that point home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. along those lines, the 288 back up north and south, that's not all groups of residents on 288. Um, it might go just field folks coming through, so you might say, well, Goodson doesn't have a problem, the roof tops and densities aren't bad, but then when you have build out in short pump, that's just unbridled, and they want to use that and they back up, it right. becomes our problem because it's in, it's in our backyard. So it's a regional problem created, uh, they, I guess, a regional issues that create a local problem for us. Right. Um, so it should be properly viewed as a regional right. issue as opposed to a good problem to solve for funding. It should be a regional type of funding or <laughs> uh, state, local, or state and federal funding. Um, but yeah, so that's just to, mm -hmm. to dovetail what he said. Some of these issues that we think are ours are not really ours, they're right. really, really regional. Uh, yeah. and, and on that, there's going to dovetail real quickly. Um, we talked about a you know, micro transit, a lot of circles around Centerville or, or around Cornell. <laughs> um, because, sure that because that's where we've done the uh, small area study so far, but there right. is another small area study coming Correct. for the speed of, and the, the, the sheer magnitude of potential development in that area is going to put all kinds of new pressures on, on our transportation. And that may change so. the conversation in some of the areas, whether it be the long range, long range transportation plan regionally, that all of a sudden there may be two priorities that come out of that that we got to get in order for to really help development and, and facilitate that. We got to have XYZ improvements or this, this brand new road built in the next five years or else the development is just going to crush the existing system. So that could change priorities. That's why it's so important to have this yearly update of the six-year plan where we just tack on another year at the end, but we can shift and move the cups around. New priority, okay, we'll kick this project down. Or projects, if like the Farragut Road extension, if there's something out of the corridor study that becomes more important, we can kick it, we can kick it to a whole new six-year plan and look at even out years of an additional plan. So we're able to really move those cups around. Certainly nothing is going to be set in stone. Yeah, it's just because courthouse and center will go through the smaller studies first doesn't mean they'll get first in line for anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Sorry, speed is not in district three, is it? <laughs> before I uh before I, kick, survey. <laughs> before I kick off the Susan County here uh Austin, I have a question. Yes. How long have you been with the county now? Ten months. Ten months. So if anybody has been paying attention during this meeting, you see the absolute complexity of this. Yours is a new position. First off, I am blown away at the command that you have on this material already after 10 months. Thank you. That, that just makes me feel great um, about our potential. I, I think about the days when I came in the board and was Tom was wearing probably three or four different hats, transportation being one of them. <laughs> Five or six, okay, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you through. Yeah, but, you know, we, we were doing this part-time, and, and this board saw the need to, that this is where we're heading. And, right. you know, our citizens a lot talk to us about growing smartly in infrastructure. Well, this is part of that, understanding how to do this. I don't believe that we would have been as successful as with the uh, smart scale, uh, I'm sorry, the regional funding as we were because of our engagements, um, because we're able, we have something to mm -hmm. develop and uh, devote full-time. So. Hey, thank you for that. Thank you for coming up to speed so quickly and, and, and really leading this. Um, and thank you to the board for realizing this need uh, and, and, and getting, I have this, you know, we don't, I, I always am reluctant to grow any sort of government, but when, when you see this type of investment, and, and I think about the studies, and okay, if we pay 80 grand to get 8 million, that's not bad. Okay. So, uh, thank you to you and mm -hmm. Tom and the rest of the staff that worked so hard on this stuff. Um, it is incredibly compact, complex, a lot of moving parts, all mucked up by politicians. So, <laughs> a lot of good stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, following that, we happen to lie on the developing edge coming out of the city. Mm -hmm. And that developing edge is where there's a lot of development, a lot of pressures. And so, dedicating resources to make sure transportation continues to flow should be centered around those developing areas where the pressures are greatest. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not surprised that. Uh, All right, any other comments before? This last slide. Okay, future topics. Okay. So, in March, yes. we were talking about doing the uh, bid on the ship. Correct. 
That's really the, the bullet number two, the transportation CIP right. review. Well, what about all these other topics? I think they're all needed, including speed up, including micro transit. Well, I mean, bridges. truthfully, and when are we going to get to these? That's part of the problem. <laughs> um, in lieu of meeting once a week on some of this stuff, because we could probably meet once a month for well, years and <laughs> Well, this is a quarterly workshop. We had to unfortunately cancel the last one because at the one of September, we were going to work through an educational opportunity with VDOT, but VDOT kind of pushed back a little bit because it was the middle of smart scale where everything was really picking up speed and going 150 miles an hour. So they asked if we could uh, move that to the beginning of this coming year. And I'm hoping that in, and it's, it is finding time for all of it because it is so complex. I mean, easily the, the middle four of these, or at least the top, the two and three, transportation, CIP, and smart scale scoring, we could easily discuss those items for four hours plus, especially the safe, the CIP review and the six year plan because the, the priorities, that, that can be a discussion that can I mean, go on. I think on. it really boils down to you know, what Mr. Peterson said. Where are our projects? Correct. Where's the money? Where's the money coming from? What are the options? You know, they, they just see it like in a you know, like spreadsheet sort of thing. Um, and are those the best priorities after we do fair number of studies, speed up, right. or, you know, or any other studies that we get done? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe don't try to fit the transportation CIP in along with the school board CIP and something else. Maybe we can have some, I mean, we've set our calendar, I know, but maybe the transportation CIP should be a dedicated Separate session. Separate from the other CIP? So we have two CIP? Sessions, one on transportation, one right, on we just have one Well, and, and that could be another meeting. Or just somehow <laughs> extend the day or something. I don't know. This is going to. I mean, it is a good Well, and, and that could be worked yeah, into, yeah. That, that could be worked into the yearly six year plan review because that's really a CIP review because something can get added mid year where there's priority changing all the time, where there's a big economic development yeah. project and all of a sudden we yeah. got a wide, you know, 522. That could be, and I just threw out some of the dates. Right now, our quarterlies are March, June, September, and December. So do we do it in June in the middle of the CIP and budget stuff? Maybe, maybe not. I feel like that'd be a lot at once. Or is a six-year update in September shaking the dust off of the, the new fiscal year? Or, 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 or do we look at this a little differently and tackle this like budget kid fund? Do we form a, a special a committee that is has a couple board members that are sitting in it a little meets more, more flexible, frequently. meets more frequently, and then we have the quarterly. So, mm. maybe, yeah. uh, I think there's, there's several ways to look at this that we might be able to accomplish what we need because we, I think we need to be, you're absolutely right. Transportation is very complex, and it's certainly going to take more than quarterly to figure it all out. That's, I think that's the case, especially with a lot of board input, which I want. I certainly don't want to be steering the ship for the whole county. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, I value board input more than anything. But to get good input, we need, we need to meet. Yeah, and that's. that's right. I mean, so we need to and I'm certainly not one to skip, you know, to advocate for a lot more meetings, but I mean, if one is required, it's required. Keep up with the pre month today, but I mean, it's, you didn't go into all the school. Well, you can tell by our right. questions, this was not just, this was not you presenting out. This is a, a real, great, this is a great workshop. These are one of my favorite yeah. sessions that we've had. Do you, I think mean, maybe your point, like maybe the CBTA, or our CBTA rep, our TPO rep could be that standard. Yeah, I think we can we can figure out how mm -hmm. what, what we can do that is and learn about my committee making ability to share for the next two weeks. Because <laughs> because we make we make we have pre meetings for our TPO. So even if you know even if Goodson does not chair, maybe that'd still be a good thing to have a pre meeting with the. You know, well, I think it would be, and maybe absolutely. it is one of the reps from the TPO and the CBTA is that standing committee that we, we do, whether it's monthly or every other month, I don't know what the answer is. Would you like staff to brainstorm and come with a recommendation in an email? Maybe shoot that out first of the year? Or? I don't think we're going to solve it here. But yeah, let's, not. Let's, <coughs> let's tackle that. And that part and how, how do we, how do we keep The staff can chew on it over the next several weeks yeah. and, and come up with something maybe around the first of the year, middle of January. We can shoot, we can give you our recommendations about how we may think it may be, be best served. I would love that. Okay. okay. Yes. And if March, June, September, and December run into other deadline times, we need to back it up. Right. Yeah. February, which goes before June, uh, May. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. All right. Let's say, um, then we need to just think about that. Yep. Yeah. Then that's, that's certainly something to think about. Awesome, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I'd like to see you know, this board not micromanage or move into Austin's office and it's not that big. <laughs> but I do think we need to have a working knowledge. You know, and I think it's very important. But not be a hovering board and put it in power staff and say, you know, keep us informed and educated at a working level, right. but not micromanage what you guys do. Absolutely. You guys are very capable of what you're doing. Bring recommendations to us, give us choices, mm -hmm. recommendations. Among the choices, right. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I don't want to see, you know, you just can't have it off. So. You have to share yourself. I only got room for one of you. I have two chairs. Yeah. I have two other chairs. I've seen his office on Zoom meetings. It's, not, it's, pretty it's not that big, but I do have two yeah, other chairs. We, we, right. we can make it work. All right. Thank you, everybody. I do see yep. a couple citizens in the room. Um, open up. Yes. I do have a comment. Um, yes. I would like to echo Mr. Chairman's comments on I'm just absolutely in awe of the way that Austin has come in and just taking this over and the way you explain it in accessible terms is wonderful thank you um, and i would also like to echo mr peterson's comments uh, it's not just 288 that uh, is getting traffic from outside of the county from personal uh, observations and some of the comments made during the project rocky public hearing when people from other counties were complaining about extra traffic coming through goochland to access 64 so I think the whole traffic is more of a regional problem. Mm -hmm. um, I remember hearing about a subdivision being planned in Powhatan at the intersection of 60 and 522 for about 500 houses. Guess what? Some of those people are going to be heading towards 64 through Goochland. So this is definitely a regional project. And maybe if we don't even build one more house, there's going to be a lot more cars on our road. So I think that bears uh, looking into. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all of your attention to this. It's very, very important. Thank you. He's eating into it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I see Mr. Lumpkins has already packed up, so I'm going to see his way of leaving the uh, This, in, in my hierarchy of what is government supposed to do, uh, transportation is one of the big three public safety, transportation, education. So the fact that this board has made the decision to invest in internal resources to address that need is, is uh, yay. That, that, that really is, is well done. I, I will say in conservation, we use a lot of acronyms. You guys win. Oh, yeah. I have way more acronyms today and a glossary of that probably in the future would help us understand TPOs and other things. Yeah, well, I understand. There's, there's a lot of things. Uh, well, I, I live in hell. I just had to follow the orders of the person who knew the acronyms. So I have easy. But no, thank you for making the investment in transportation because it is a, a core service that government provides. Uh, and, and, uh, Lights blinking, so. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, sure. Any other board comments? Uh, thank you, guys. We'll see Being you done, um, I will adjourn this board of supervisors meeting until Tuesday, January 3rd at 12:30 for our audit and finance <coughs> committee, um, and then our regularly scheduled business meeting after that. So we are adjourned for the rest of 